Good morning. Thank you so much for coming. Great to see so many people, bright and early, especially since it's um, sunny and bright outside. Um, so normally in Perugia, moderators pitch the panels. Uh, in this case, it's slightly different. Um, I was supposed to be a speaker on the panel, but our moderator sadly had to pull out last minute. So um, they, what you see in front of you today is slightly different from what is uh, in the print program. Um, but I think we have a great, it's impossible to represent all the perspectives when it comes to something as complicated as um, colonialism and decolonizing journalism. But we do have a great panel today. Um, Isaac Amuke is the founder of Debank Media in Nairobi, um, Kenyan journalist. Lina Srivastava is the filmmaker and founder of the Center for Transformational Change. And Anup Kafle is the editor-in-chief of the rest of the world. The description, I'm hoping that what we are going to discuss will be also slightly different from the description that you see in the program. Um, I think that focuses mostly on um, sort of the dilemmas of newsroom and decolonizing newsroom. Um, but I think in order to have a broader discussion, it's really much better to also touch on how do we decolonize narratives and how do we decolonize sort of larger stories that we tell. And a lot of it starts in the newsroom, but it's not just um, newsroom. So I'll start with a nicely uh, broad question, and I'll start with you, um, Isaac. What does, um, given that it is so complex and so multi-layered, what we are attempting to talk about here today, um, what does decolonizing journalism mean to you? <laughs> uh, tough question. <laughs> <laughs> like he wasn't prepared for that. Uh, it means many things to different people, I think. Uh, but I think uh, it has a good meaning, it has an, uh, a bad meaning, and it has an ugly meaning. The good one is that it means independence, and it means freedom. The bad one it me is that you're going against a system, and the ugly one is when you go against a system, there will be casualties, and so on. Um, so it's it's a political it's a political conversation as opposed to a journalistic conversation even um, yeah so it's it has good bad and ugly yeah from where I sit. Lena, do you want to try to tackle that too? Sure. Um, I think the word here is political. Um, so just. Uh, just outing myself as the non-journalist, right, on this panel, because I am a social entrepreneur. Um, I do work in narrative change in the realm of human rights and international development, basically rights-based development. Um, and I work very often with filmmakers, so I do documentary production, do social impact strategy and such. Most of the work that we do is in the realms of displacement, forced displacement, climate justice, racial and gender inequality. I cannot do my work without thinking about coloniality or decoloniality. And what that means is power, right, power shift. These questions are absolutely political. And you can't think about, um, I can't think about narrative change or narrative shift in any of those realms without thinking about sort of the fact that we've been living and breathing coloniality for 500 years. And so unpacking that question um, means that we're looking, we're looking at history, we're looking at who gets to make decisions now and what the future looks like in terms of who gets to tell the stories, who, who gets authorship, ownership, who rules the platforms, who owns the platforms. So it's like it's a very multi-layered question, but it comes down to politics and power. Anup, do you want to weigh in? So, so I think, um, you know, from a personal perspective, who gets to tell the stories, like, matters, right? And that sort of, like, defines, for me, sort of, like, decolonizing journalism would mean uh, making sure that the stories, the journalism, reflects the communities that we cover. And the journalists who are doing them uh, also reflect the communities that they are writing about. 
Uh, and that's sort of like in large part why I was attracted to the ethos of REST world because our mission as we are client is to challenge expectations about whose experience with technology truly matters. So it's kind of like leaning on a lot of the communities that we cover, finding journalists in those places, and really allowing them to tell those stories and being, a, I mean, so we are essentially a vehicle that's kind of working on standards and formatting and, and bringing those stories out for the Western audience. You know, the, the, I, think, I think the real challenge of this conversation is the complexity of all the layers. I think the, one of the lowest hanging root, the fruits here that we could sort of pick up on, but maybe don't spend loads and loads of time on, is the, that whole foreign correspondent parachuting in, going into places, um, telling the stories. Um, I just want your thoughts and jump in at any, you know, whatever, whether the so you see things changing and you know what is i mean there is there is a value to foreign correspondency and i sort of say that as someone who was a foreign correspondent for many years but also as someone who you know working for the i worked for the bbc for many years and one of them i remember very early on in my career i was in my early 20s in this very veteran experienced um BBC correspondent um, sat me down once and said, look, I think you're great. I just need to give you one piece of advice. Lose the accent. you got to lose this accent. You're not going to make it. And um, I, I never took it, as you can tell. But, um, but this, you know, there has been a big shift between then and now. Like we recently... Uh, now as you know I've moved on and I co-founded uh, a new startup and we were recently producing a podcast and for in partnership with um, one of the podcast streaming platforms and they were insisting on having someone with an with an accent and you obviously hear many more accents you um, see much more diversity um, on screens but is that is that partially what we're talking about when we're talking about decolonizing? Are things getting better? Is this a sign of a more profound change or is it sort of a sub more superficial kind of shift? Curious to jump in, whoever wants to take it. I mean, Isaac, I think it's, a, it's very interesting in um, across the continent, across the African continent, in Kenya in particular, you know, because it's always been held up as a place, you know, people coming in from the outside. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my first thought is, you know, it's, it's like asking someone if they want independence. You know, like the colonizer asking the colonizer if they want independence. Of course the answer is yes, that it would be ideal to do away with the foreign correspondence and have locals tell the stories. But the other question now is, is their capacity and like, can we get the independence now, now, right? So it's like, let's prepare for the independence. You see what I mean? So that the ideal situation is to have Kenyans tell the stories, but are they, are they ready? Do we have enough resources? Do we have enough capacity and so on and so forth? So that's how I'd look at it because in Nairobi, the most vibrant journalism community is the foreign correspondent community. Uh, if you remove it, you know, if a journalist is arrested, if they issue a statement, everybody listens. Um, what does that mean then to the ecosystem as it is? So do you want independence? Yes. Do you want it now? I don't know. So in, in the realm of documentary, again, um, I think it is getting better from the perspective of, you know, at least Western-made documentaries. Um, Ten years ago, about yeah, ten years ago, um, I had co-launched this community called Regarding Humanity, um, which was like a five-year project on thinking through ethical and effective narratives and design um, in in humanitarian the humanitarian sectors. And it was we created it because we just kept seeing helicopter storytelling, right? So you would have American or British or you know sort of like white-led storytelling, but in you know, for lack of a better term global south communities and it wasn't community led 10 years later like i'm i've been an, an advisor to an organization called firelight media which is all about community led storytelling there are there's an organization now called color congress um, that is about creating an ecosystem of 
uh, filmmakers and documentarians and journalists of color. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't have foreign correspondence. It doesn't mean that you can't have Western-led storytelling, especially when there is a translation component, you know, to a certain extent. But as Anup was saying, it takes deep listening and it takes a certain, you know, humility. I'm not necessarily that interested in the question of like diversity and inclusion because to me that's not necessarily justice, but there is a question, you know, there is something to be said about representation. And I can see the change in 10 years where there are, there's much more concern on decolonizing narrative in that way. Um, I, I, I think that's interesting and sort of worth digging into a little bit more. So what is the distinction between diversity and inclusion and that concept of decolonizing? What's the difference? I mean, I think it's, it, it gets back to, you know, sort of the question of power again. Um, just because you happen to be hired as a documentarian or, or a journalist or something, and you are, quote unquote, of the community, doesn't mean you have the power to change the policies, right? So what you'll often see, what I've often seen is people come in, they're hired, and they are told to tell the story in a very particular way. Otherwise, it's going to be taken away from them. Um, or they don't get the funding. Like, it has to be, you know, sort of in, in a particular way. So representation alone, diversity alone, doesn't get us to decolonization. It's one step on the way, right? So it's not the thing. But, it, but isn't, I mean, maybe it's slightly different with documentary filmmaking, but in journalism in particular, it is a quite a hierarchical system, right? Where decisions are made by those who are curating the publications and editors and so on. So isn't there a little bit of a conflict there? I mean, if we just let everyone tell whatever stories they want to tell. I mean. Yeah, I mean, I think like, you know, for me, the important thing is mindset shift, right? Because just having, for example, you know, when you ask like, are things changing? Some of the encouraging things for me is like, looking at the New York Times and seeing Abdi Latif, you know, overseeing an East Africa coverage, right, versus Gettleman, who was doing it for so many years, for example. You look at Mujib Mashal, who was doing Afghanistan correspondent, is now like a South Asia bureau chief. And I think like, you know, the decision making, like the leaders in newsrooms who have that mindset, who feel like this is how we're going to tell stories, that is more important than like some incremental you know, small changes here and there. So I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing, right? I mean, the fact that I'm able to lead a global newsroom, um, I don't think that was happening like 10 years ago. But we're such a small place. And I think that the, the institutions that actually have an impact are the big institutions. I don't think it's happening fast enough. I don't think it's happening at a pace um, that it needs to be. Um, and then again, in, even in that, there are, there are layers, like, you know, how are decisions being made? Like, who's funding these organizations, right? Like, you know, what is important for those people? Uh, we've seen new media kind of players day in, day out. And I think, like, you know, you may be able to sort of effect change, but you will also have to sort of, like, um, execute somebody else's vision. So one of the, and again, if you, if you want to jump in and add something to it, please do. Um, but w if not you know one of the things one of the, the reason I was supposed to be on this panel and I know there's nothing worse than a moderator who talks too much but uh, I'll try to be brief but the reason I was on this panel is because I'd quote a story you know we're thinking hard about how to cover colonialism not so not so much you know how to decolonize the newsroom but how you know how to tell these narratives and how these narratives are playing out and kind of the historical narratives are playing out and um, I have been just because of where I come from I've been thinking especially hard about this whole idea of colonialism ever since um, the full-scale invasion of Ukraine um, because you know I come from I'm, I'm Georgian so I come from a country that has been um, you know colonized um, uh, in a slightly possibly different way um, and in a way that is often is not seen in the West as, as colonization because the stories that the Russians told um, uh, to the world around, um, you know, the Soviet Union and so on uh, were and stories... Um, you know, we're not stories of colonial, like it was a completely different different narrative. And it's interesting how it's playing out um, in um, the way that this conflict, this the war is being fought because Russia has made it 
priority to push itself as an anti-colonial power in Asia and in Africa. Um, L Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, is um, in Latin America. He's on a tour of Latin America. He's just published a massive op-ed in one of the leading Mexican papers talking about the need for the multipolar world, the need to uh, get rid of the Western hegemony, um, and so on. Um, and, uh, you know, f to anyone who comes from the Baltics or from uh, Ukraine or from Georgia, from the countries that um, have been squeezed and occupied and colonized um, by Russia, it's an incredibly hypocritical position, but it's a position that's also, I think, Isaac, if, I think resonating really in Africa in really, really big ways, right? So suddenly the, this colonialism in itself is is an issue, but from my point of view, and I'm breaking my promise of not talking too much, uh, you know, it, it does feel like, you know, it's once again the big former colonial powers that are setting these narratives where the voices of people who have been colonized are not actually coming across and being heard. And with that, finally come to my question, what can journalism do to change that? Both local journalism, you know, national journalism in different countries, but also um, the Western media and the industry that's largely represented here? Uh, I think that that scenario you've painted itself is a product of not decolonizing journalism, for example, because if you tell a lot of people in Africa that Russia is a colonial power, they might entertain the idea, but they won't look at it the same way they look at Britain, for example, right? And so when the world expects the media, for example, in Africa to speak in one voice and say, Russia is the aggressor, the media in Africa is looking at the West and being like, we've never been comrades. Like, we are not speaking the same language. Why do you want us to speak the same language now? Uh, or that we see now we've reported on our wars, right? Uh, which some of which are ongoing and so on. So, or, or, why, how, or how you didn't. Or how you didn't, yeah. So why do you want all of us to say something about Russia? Then, and, and it's counterproductive because now it's like, to piss you off, maybe we might even be lenient with Russia. You see what I mean? Uh, so it's, it's, it's like a domino effect if the decolonization doesn't happen. Because when you need this person who you, you, you don't consider important, a time comes when you need them, and now they can't, they can't lend a hand because they're not comrades. Like, yeah. So it's complicated like that. I'm wondering if you have anything, like whether that's the same dynamic that's happening in Asia and I, mean, I think like you know one thing as you talked about that that I thought of was Nepal, my home country, and how we do journalism. We were never colonized, uh, but we are hugely influenced by India, which was colonized. But India is in a way sort of like you know it carries massive power and influence in South Asia. So in many ways, how journalism or the kind of stories that we do is dictated by what happens in New Delhi, right? So you're not kind of even even. If you want to read stories about the US, China, like Russia narrative right now, it's happening from a New Delhi perspective. So the way I talk to my journalist friends in Kathmandu is kind of like, well, you have to look at people and their suffering, I think, like, you know, because otherwise you are just doing somebody else's perspective, somebody else's view. But if you look at what's truly happening on the ground, then you're able to sort of like, you know, that, that can be the Nepali perspective of doing stories, how Nepal covers the conflict in Russia, Ukraine. Um, it's just like one example. Um, I, I think, you know, what Isaac just said is about, you know, multiplicity of perspectives. So the, the experience of being colonized, which is, an, as I said, it's an ongoing process, right? We're not, we're not past it. Places are still either colonized or being colonized. It's like, you know, either takes the form of extraction or violence or, um, you know, of, of imperialism. Um, and... The experience of people who are on the ground, like it, it kind of comes down to what you define as community, like what is community-led? Um, and often when, when I do my work, again, 
as a non-journalist, I can define who the community is in a very particular way. It is the people who are most affected by the issue that I'm, I'm dealing with, and what do they want, and what do they need, and how do I help them get that, you know, as an activist. Um, but not everybody has the same experience of colonialism, right? And you have class issues, you have gender issues, you have, you know, all these different perspectives that complicate what a community-led perspective is, right? So you have to tease that apart, you know, to a certain extent. And, you know, when it comes to the question of, you know, of how international outlets are reporting on Ukraine or on Russian aggression, um, again, it comes down to, you know, who, um, who gets to tell the story, right? Who is defining the parameters of that narrative? And who's getting platformed, right? So when you say, you know, Sergei Lavrov is, you know, sort of being published in Mexican newspapers, you know, who made that decision, right? You see, you see uh, in the United States, like I'm, you know, so I'm American, and I see how a lot of um, journalism outlets, you know, are, are so enthralled still to like, you know, people who want fascism, to Trump, DeSantis, things like this. Um, or in India, like my, my, my family's from India, I'm, I'm not Indian, but um, I see the way media has basically become an arm of the state almost in essence, right? So who's getting platformed and who gets to decide that? That is, again, you know, a question of, of power. Natalia, if I may. Yeah, please. Uh, to ask that question differently, would the U.S. Secretary of State publish an op-ed in a Latin American newspaper? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because Lavrov thinks it's important. So would the, the American Secretary of State want to publish an op-ed somewhere else? Like, do they consider those platforms important? I, mean, I think they do. I'm just like thinking about examples. I mean, just, you know, for whether it's Americans, because I see the Chinese ambassador and the Indian ambassador publishing op-eds in Kathmandu's newspaper all the time. So I think it's like, again, it's like what's the audience that you're trying to influence, right? Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure U.S. ambassadors have published uh, op-eds in, in Latin American newspapers, African newspapers. It's just like, what's the issue at stake and who are you trying to influence? Yeah. Um. So is the whole decolonization conversation in journalism the right one to be having at all? Like, is it, is it possible, or are, are we wasting everyone's time here? <laughs> is, it, is it possible, because, because it's so tied in into much larger societal problems and issues, and it's an issue that is so still ongoing and, um, you know, so affects us on, on so many levels. Um, is that the conversation that we need to be having, or, or not? I, I, I genuinely wonder. Because we haven't managed to define what that means yet. We still have a little time. I mean, I think, yes, I think it is because it is, it's a foundational question. Um, it's structural and systemic, right? So it's there. So do we need to work on multiple aspects of power and presence and voice and decision making and ownership and all of those? Yes, but all of those are affected by decoloniality or coloniality, all of those are part of it, right? So I think it is a foundational question. I don't think you can talk about narrative shift at all without talking about decoloniality. I think it's an important conversation, but I think it reminds us of what journalism is because it's, it's, it's all about stories. And so what we are saying is why are you telling our stories the way you're telling them? Or why are you not allowing us to tell our stories ourselves or the way you want to tell them? Uh, for example, to use the New York Times example, Abdi covers East Africa. Uh, right now there's a war in Sudan. So he has to go to Sudan and report there. In Uganda, there's an anti-homosexuality bill. He has to report on that. In Kenya, there's an anti-homosexuality bill. He has to, to report on that and, and so on and so forth. How can one person do that? Right, uh, because now they'll have to go to Sudan and call 10 people and ask for their perspectives, then write the story. Then someone else in Sudan will be like, no, he hasn't told the story properly. 
because he didn't talk to this other person, right? So maybe the New York Times needs a correspondent in each country in East Africa, for example, as a beginning, right? So it's about stories. So um, Africa has 54 countries. How many correspondents do you have, for example? And so on. So it's about stories. And if it's about stories, then let's have conversations about stories, right? So they, it, it really comes down to the basics. So let's, uh, it's, it's good to have the lofty conversation, but it's really about the story, right? There are protests happening in Kenya right now, which could escalate into something. Nobody's paying attention, but when it blows up, everyone will be there. You, you see what I mean? So it, it's complicated, but it's not complicated. Yeah, but I think like, you know, when you ask like, is it important? I think it's really important because uh, the question to ask is like, are you doing justice to the stories that you're telling? Of course, that, that ties into, I think we've, we've talked about this, like who's telling the stories a number of times, which means that I think there's something there about like, who are you assigning to tell the stories? But it's more than just kind of like saying something happened here, you're from this place, do this story. That's an assignment. I think like there needs to be genuine listening for example, you were talking about it could spiral into something, right? Believing those people who you've assigned to kind of like have a stake in that story is as important as just kind of giving that person a byline and paying that person well. So I think editors need to trust readers and audiences a little bit more um, because I think that most Western-led you know, outlets think that the readers don't want to read about something or aren't, aren't going to be interested in something, and they'll often like just either string the story along and bury it or not report on it until something blows up when it's almost too late, right? Um, and I think, you know, most people, not most, but I think there's a, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a significant swath of people who would actually read it or, or consume that media um, if it were provided to them, you know, and I think there has to be a little more trust on, you know, who the audience is, who the readers are, um, whether it's in general audiences or in, like, people who can influence, you know, what's happening. It's just, there are so many stories um, that, you know, we, and so I'm often, you know, I, I work with documentary, you know, people and you know, storytellers, and I'm often the subject, right? My projects are subjects, right, to a certain extent of, of, of pieces. Um, and often I find that the way they're reported is not what I wanted to happen. <laughs> There's, it's uh, um, often, you know, they will um, report on an angle that I didn't necessarily think was the right angle. Um, and it's because the journalist or the editor thought that was the way the story should go, as opposed to what was the truth of the story. Um, and I think there has to be a little more openness and trust and experimentation when it comes to what people want to read and consume. Yeah, I, I wanted to touch on the, the ownership question and the role that that plays in this power structures of journalism that make it a byproduct of larger colonial power structures or post-colonial or neo-colonial power structures. Isaac, I'm looking at you. <laughs> uh, of course, like ownership is, is a fundamental question and tied to that is funding, right? New models and so on. Uh, and, and question of sustainability and so on because ownership determines how much people are paid determines, uh, it can even determine the tone of a story, and so on and so forth. Uh, a lot of like legacy media in Africa is either owned by politicians or uh, foreigners or businessmen who want to wield political influence and so on and so forth. Uh, and so it, it it always disadvantages the journalist, right? Like journalism is one of the careers that people are being told not to go into right now, right? Because of, of all, this, all these things that are happening. And, and it ties back to the decoloni decolonizing conversation because when you say all the foreign correspondents should go, the people working in, in the local newsrooms are not motivated, right? Because of the ownership 
and, and all those structures. They are paid peanuts, so they don't invest in their stories. So they'll not grow as reporters. They don't read, they don't engage with the world, they don't even watch the news, right? So it, it affects the entire, it's like someone has poisoned the water, right? Uh, so uh, in the decolonizing conversation, I think, I suspect there should be a conversation about reparations, which is how do you help local journalism, right? So that whoever owns this media house, uh, the Gates Foundation, I don't know, is funding health reporting and so on and so forth. How do you structure that so that it builds, it builds a strong local ecosystem of reporters, of people who will replace those foreign correspondents one day? I mean, you mentioned Gates Foundation, but isn't that... It's a that, bad example. Isn't, well, no, I think it's a good example because isn't it ultimately the expression of, like, yet another powerful, you know, white man now owning um, a foundation that essentially owns the conversation about public health and so many others that come out of it across the entire continent? Um, is it yes, that yes. a form of colonialism kind of 2.0? The, the answer is political because... Uh, we have to use the tools of the oppressor and, and we have right. to use their resources because we don't have the resources. Our owners are not empowering us. So we'll use whatever, you know, uh, those resources, they say they're like a gun. Whoever picks it first uses it. So we'll, we'll have to find a way. You know, it's like fighting capitalism, you know. Uh, it, capitalism funds the people who fight it. Right, <laughs> so it's the same thing here. The, there's no other place you can get resources mm. to decolonize, right? Mm. So it's how do we use these resources from these people, and I'm calling them these people. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, I, I mean, the, it's an interesting. I don't know if it's a dilemma for you, and I don't mean to, you know, put you into into a defensive mode here, but I think you're another example of, uh, and your story is an example of an interesting um, dilemma. Yeah, you say 10 years ago you wouldn't have been um, editing, uh, leading a global publication, um, but at the same time your owner also comes from that, you know, the owner of um, Rest of the World, the founder of Rest of the World is Sophie Schmidt, who is you know, it also comes from, from that new global elite who have incredible amount of power. She's the daughter of um, Eric Schmidt, Google's Eric Schmidt, have incredible amount of power and have amassed incredible amount of wealth. Um, and this is not unique. There are others as well, you know, and there are examples of, I mean, Facebook in Kenya is a great example of uh, of the conversation and the, the media being so tied to to Meta, to Facebook, and so on. I mean, is that something that you think about, you reckon with? You know, the, the very candid answer is I don't think about it. And here's why, because we're not unique, right? I think about it as an opportunity that's presented to me that I wouldn't have had if someone like Sophie, for example, in this case, what hadn't founded this organization or you know, hadn't sort of decided to pick me to lead an organization like this. Now, what I do with that opportunity is something that I think about a lot. Am I kind of like, you know, is, is, you know am I, does it reflect my values? Like, am I doing um, the stories justice? Am I making sure that that money is going towards sort of telling the kind of stories that truly matter? Are we sort of paying people um, uh, with, you know, uh, paying people equally in, in places that they operate. That's something I think about. And I think, like, you know, if you look at just the me U.S. media landscape just in the past year, you've had publications that, that have taken money from, well, taken money from. I mean, they're funded by VCs, right? They're funded by um, Gulf monarchies. Um, and um, that's, where, that's where money is. And I think, truly, I think, like, you know, when you have a leadership uh, when you have a diverse leadership in place, I, you know, you want to take that opportunity and figure out what can I do with this money. It's an opportunity. Don't let it go to waste. Um, and for me, particularly at Rest of the World, like, you know, Sophie had the vision. And um, my job and, you know, Michael, who's sitting here as the executive editor, our job is to execute on sort of the, the mission of the publication. Uh, so if it doesn't dictate what we cover, 
Um, Sophie doesn't meddle in what we cover, uh, but she's provided resources, and I'm personally very grateful for that. Mm. Nina, you brought up the ownership. Isaac, did you want to add to that? I wanted to say something at time, yeah. Because uh, sometimes we talk about these things as if they're clean lines, right? And so to decolonize, for example, we're going to need a lot of resources. Where are those resources going to come from? I give an extreme example of apartheid, right? Which is you have to negotiate with the person who has oppressed you and even use their resources, right? Uh, so it's not a clean line. A few people might have to sell out so that others in, in, in future won't have to sell out. Yeah. Yeah, but the, the, the question is whose resources are they, right? In the case of, you know, apartheid or, you know, most of Africa, the wealth that was built was built from Africans, you know? So, you know, your, question, your, your point about reparations is a good one, right? So it's not, it, it isn't clean lines and there are resource and power holders that have um, benefited from colonialism, right? And it's not necessarily, I think, you know, there's, I've taken money from Ford, I've taken money from Rockefeller, I've taken money from like, you know, there are certain people I won't take money from for wh whatever reason, you know, because again, I'm a human rights activist, but you know, there are clean lines, you know, and I can't do my work unless I'm getting money from people who are, you know, have gotten that, those resources from not always great places and also are dictating impact metrics in a way that I don't always agree with, you know, to a certain extent. So, you know, you try to work around that um, with an eye to community injustice and things like that. But you were going to ask me a question about ownership. I, I did. I, I, yeah, I mean, you're sort of addressing it, okay. but there, there is, I mean, it's the same, it's the same question, basically, the, the role that ownership, but I think you more or less um, answer that. I do have a couple more questions, but I also want to open it up as well. Um, oh, oh, great. <laughs> so let's start with you. Hi, I'm first going to introduce myself. My name is Halima Salat. I am with Lighthouse Reports. I'm originally from Kenya. I live in the Netherlands. <laughs> Um, I worked as a journalist, uh, TV, radio, in Kenya, and it took me a record of five years to get back into journalism in my adopted country. <laughs> um, the, one of the things that I honestly struggle with when it comes to changing the narrative is where the opportunities for, let's say, um, a weird example, if the like the 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 protests that were happening in Kenya. I was reading <laughs> in a Dutch newspaper, the NRC, um, about oh chaos is happening, and I was like, I've been knocking on your door for five years. I could have written that story way better. So I'm wondering if there is like ways where we can open the diaspora, exile, I don't know, uh, journalism uh, community. Thank you very much. Any of you would like to take that? She's, she said it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They need to open that, like it's, it's, it's a no-brainer, really. And that's why the question is, is it about the story or is it about something else? It's mm. clearly about something else, because if it's about the story, they'd let her tell it. And one thing I'll just say there is, um, I think it is possible. It, it, it's a real struggle. Um, and one way I know I've gotten around it is by trying to find allies, people who look like me, who've done it before, yeah. who wield a little bit more influence in that. And I think like, you know, that's, it's a struggle. It's a work in progress. But when you kind of like lean on people who are like you, who've done it before, it makes it a little bit easier. Yeah. I also have to say that so much of it is just inertia, I think, as well, and just not thinking enough about these issues. I mean, I remember in 2008 when Russia invaded Georgia, I was based in Lebanon, and I called my editors in London, and I was the only Georgian working for the news gathering in the BBC, and I said, should I get on the plane now? And they said, no, no, it's okay, don't worry about it. I was like, what, what do you guys mean? <laughs> You could probably use me. No, no, no. You know, I got on a plane eventually. But it, it's so a lot of it is just not thinking, which is, I guess, why it is important to right. to raise these issues. And um, the way I think 
that lets people off the hook a little bit. I mean, I, I know I've said the word power so many times today, but I think, you know, like, again, in the documentary world, you'll often see people who are lo quote unquote local journalists or diaspora journalists, and they're called fixers, not journalists, right? They'll, Same you know, it's, yeah. right? And it's just like, they are actually journalists. There is a, you know, and I think I, it's, it's not a question, it's apt, that's the answer. It's like, how do you make sure that the, the people who are either local or diaspora who have an extra insight, right, are brought into, whether it's through networks, like Saja in, in, in New York is a the South Asian Journalist Association, you know, those kinds of organizations are meant to create community and yeah. professional networking. That needs to happen, like, you know, that's a model that needs to happen. Or say, like, I've, I've been very lucky to work with uh, the New Humanitarian, which is a, you know, platform. Yeah, I was going yeah. to ask you, yeah. I mean, I, I, they are a model that I think is absolutely fantastic, um, and they give me hope. So I worked with them last year on the question of decolonization of the entire aid industry, right? And we sort of did this, you know, closed door thing. But they are very, they, they're both self-reflective on how they think about their own position within the colonial structures and also how you rethink the entire sector. And they work with local journalists, mm -hmm. right? And they're called journalists. <laughs> um, so I think it's, you know, you need, you need support structures. Um, you need platform ownership, but yeah. you need support structures. There was, a, there was a great project in Afghanistan called um, Sahar Speaks uh, that placed Afghan women into, mainstream, into bureaus of mm -hmm. mainstream um, uh, media mm -hmm. in Kabul. And uh, yeah, so there are initiatives. I mean, obviously that's now gone, but... Um, yes, you... The microphone. Yeah, sorry. Should oh, I stand up? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Sanne Breimer. Um, I founded Inclusive Journalism. I focus on decoloniality from a white perspective. Uh, and I often see in a discussion about this topic that that perspective is um, not really being discussed about. I think even the word white is not uh, mentioned so much. And I think it is also not um, uh, a conversation about black and white because the topic is much more complex than that. But I do think that it is important to also um, emphasize that white people and Western journalists, journalists from the West, need to do a lot more work on this topic. If we talk about opening doors, if we talk about changing uh, mindset, there's um, a lot more white journalists can do and I think uh, it is also about um, misunderstanding what decoloni decoloniality really means, which makes that a lot of uh, white Western journalists are a little bit afraid of touching the topic. Um, so I was wondering what is your uh, vision on that? I mean, I'll just say that I agree. I think often sort of like this, this, this burden of change falls on kind of people of color. And I say that, you know, I mean, I don't have experience of like facing colonialism in, in its truest kind of like sense, but right, like when we talk about change, whether it's in a newsroom or in an organization, that burden often falls on people of color, right? I mean, this panel, it's like, I mean, and we're talking about, you're right, right? We should have brought a white person here. And I think, I think the conversation, honestly, like, I mean. I come from the Caucasus. You're from Georgia. Caucasian. For, for, for me, you are rest of world, right? So. Um. No, and you know, you're not white and you haven't been colonized and I am and I have been. So is it helpful? Are, are race terms helpful actually at all? Yeah, but, but, uh, so, but um, I, th I think your perspective is also really uh, important because of the, the Russian narrative, also often misunderstood. But um, I think we do deal with Eurocentrism and US centrism, and that is still, it's not Russian centrism that we are dealing with in the mm -hmm. world. Most of the funding well, for uh, journalism, for example. I mean, Russian also, centrism is the reason why children are dying in Har Kharkiv, so. Yeah. Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I, I, I don't want to say that your uh, perspective is not true, so I don't mean to um, interrupt you in that way. But I think if you look at how journalism uh, globally is organized, then we also need to look at the most of the funding is coming also from the West, uh, right? And not from uh, Russia. So if, if we talk about power also in journalism and the way we, um, I'd say, um, want to bring journalism forward, then the power lies mostly in the West. And 
not necessarily. Well, look, for which audiences? I mean, RT is hiring in Africa left and right, incredibly. You know, China, what about the Chinese? Yeah. There are a lot of people who are, you know, both working for Chinese state agencies and practicing, you know, what they call a form of journalism. Mm -hmm. So are, yeah, I'm not necessarily arguing with you, but that's also a very, you know, US yeah, and European uh, yeah. centric perspective, isn't it? Well, yeah, maybe, yeah. Of course, I'm from uh, Europe, so, but I, I, I don't think I'm saying something very weird if I say that global journalism is very Western-centric. Uh, I mean, there... Uh, yeah, I mean... <laughs> yeah. We have, we have five minutes left, and we have more hands and then, than minutes. Yes, Tinko. Hi, I don't know if you can hear me. Um, full disclosure, I know Natalia. Natalia knows me. My name is Tinku Ray, and I'm managing editor of a mainstream public radio show in the United States. And I can tell you from experience that it was so much harder for me to make my way up to a decision-making um, position in mainstream media in America. Um, I'm at a position where I can fight back against all my white editors in terms of the voices that we hear. And I think Anup, as well as Seema, you both mentioned these very well, of how difficult it is for people like us at that position to make those decisions. And I think it's also about creating spaces where we're giving the support systems to people of color, journalists of color, to be able to come up through the, the processes. And I'd love to hear more about that. And how can we do that, especially in Western media? Yeah. Um so, I think um, there are a couple of things. One is, I just wanted to say one thing to you, which is that in, in the U.S. anyway, we don't talk about decoloniality very much, even though we are very imperialist. Um, we don't, it's not a frame that is mentioned enough. But we, we, there is a really good conversation happening now across the board on white supremacy. Um, and when it comes to your question, you know, I think the, the conversation that's been happening over the last at least 10 years or so um, around thinking around, you know, who is in decision making, who is promoted, who gets to tell the story, who's a fixer, who's a journalist, you know, all those different things, it has been affected by the question around, like, what does white supremacy look like? Um, in the sort of the rest of the world, we're talking more about decoloniality. Um, but I think there is a really interesting conversation happening now, but it takes people like Tinku, you know, to like literally like, you know, walk around with, you know, sharp elbows and say, no, I'm going to, I'm going to get to the top. It shouldn't have to be that way. It shouldn't have to be that we are constantly breaking these, you know, these barriers. Um, the way I've managed to make it through sort of the social innovation and the media and the, you know, human rights you know, world as, as a leader or as an owner is because I've started my own things, right? And I've cobbled it together. Um, and so I can make my own decisions. Um, it takes people like Anub, it takes people like Tinku to sort of say, you know, we've done it, now we're gonna pull people up. Um, but there have to be more support structures. There has to be a deeper conversation around what white supremacy looks like in journalism and in, um, in uh, storytelling in particular, um, and what, what decoloniality really means. But in the practical sense, it means support structure, funding for platforms that are, you know, sort of non-white led, women led, um, LGBTQ led, um, any of those things. Like we need to have, we need to loosen, we might be using the tools of the oppressors, but they can't go to more white people and white male people. Um, I don't know if that answered your question, but like we've got to open it up. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just you know add very quickly in a very practical sense that 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 term pulling up is so important when you are in a in a, in a position of privilege. And I consider myself powerful to some degree right now, right? And anytime someone reaches out to me and says, "Hey, we're hiring. Do you know someone?" I make it a point to include um, 
I use the word brown a lot, but it basically means people who look like me. Um, but I, I make it a point to include like two or three names there. You know, it, it's not all going to be like diverse names. So you're looking at sort of talent, experience, all of that. But I make it a point to do that. Um, so that's sort of like one, trying to pull people. Another is like one, when you're in an institution, making sure the team kind of reflects the community. And then what are you doing to make sure that two years, five years down the line, they can do the job that you're doing, right? And that means investing in training, investing in talent. Um, and I think about that a lot because I didn't have that at one point and I know how important it is. So you know, that goes back to sort of the idea of like providing support structures, training for people so they have what you do. Unfortunately, we are out of time, but thank you very much for coming along. Um, and thank you very year. much. Just, just... But we do do it every year. <laughs>